AMD have been enjoying huge gains in the enthusiast DIY market for quite some time now. Even with Intel's 11th gen launching less than a year ago and being frankly lackluster compared to the competition. But now they're back with the 12th gen Alder Lake processors. And oh boy, are you in for a treat. Let's do this. I wish these files would transfer faster. Come on! Whoa, is that the Fire Cuda 510 NVMe drive with its blistering fast speeds of 3450 megabytes a second read, 3200 megabytes a second write, and capacities of up to two terabyte? I can have these files transferred in no time. And if I'm looking for the ultimate performance, I could even get the fourth generation Fire Cuda 520. I better check the link in the description to find out more details. So you've probably noticed that today is the day where we can talk about the performance on the new Intel 12th gen processors. And I'm sure you've seen a ton of videos and your social media feeds are pretty much blowing up with content right now. So I don't want to talk too much before kind of showing you the real reason that you're actually here, which isn't about me showing you what a processor like this actually looks like, but it's more about those juicy benchmarks. But let's talk about what we do have here and kind of what it means and where it's positioned. So we have three chips here, the i5-12600K, the i7-12700K, and the flagship i9-12900K. These, along with the three KF SKUs, meaning no iGPU, are the six models that Intel are releasing today at launch. But you can safely assume that others will come at a later date, including the one I'm actually most looking forward to, and kind of feel that it was Intel's saving grace on the 11th gen, the 400F SKU, so the 12400F. You may remember content that we did on that, where we found it was actually the best value CPU that Intel had for the money. And you may also remember the 11600K, which we found to just be dire compared to what Team Red had to offer at the time. So for anyone who doesn't know, the new Intel 12th gen processors, codenamed Alder Lake, take kind of things and do it a little bit differently. Instead of playing the cores, threads, and speed gain that AMD have been frankly winning for the last couple of generations, Intel have opted for more of a hybrid solution. I mean, take the 12900K for instance, sporting eight performance cores with hyperthreading, giving us the conventional 16 threads or cores that we kind of expect. But alongside this are eight efficiency cores, which don't feature hyperthreading or multi-threading. So you actually have 16 cores, but 24 threads. And therefore, not all threads are equal. I kind of feel like that needs to be put onto a t-shirt. Not all threads are equal. Intel, if you see this and I don't know, maybe you decide to kind of go with it. We've seen, you know, AMD do some pretty cool t-shirts. If you decide to go with it, I want the royalties. That side is kind of new old technology that we once saw on Intel before, but have also seen from the likes of ARM, which are often used in smartphones. But with the principle essentially being the same, basically sporting performance cores for those bigger tasks like gaming or rendering, while the little efficiency cores are able to handle background tasks that aren't as demanding and therefore also use less power, which in turn generates less heat. And Intel actually believe this gives you better performance per watt. And while that's all well and good, with something so different, I mean, is it really enough to kind of beat the competition? Well, Intel, they also claim that they are the leaders in gaming, with AMD temporarily taking the title away from them with the Ryzen 5000 series. And let's not also forget that Intel CEO Pat Gelsinger has been, well, he's been quite vocal lately with Intel's future direction and also how it aligns with AMD. And with that level of confidence, you'd expect great things, right? Well, let's find out and run those glorious benchmarks.
So first off, for the fairest comparisons, we tried to keep our hardware as similar as possible. So on our Alder Lake test bench, we used the Maximus Hero from ASUS, 32 gig of Corsair Dominator RGB DDR5, 5200 megahertz memory, a Notchua D15S, Gigabyte RTX 3080 graphics card, and a Corsair HX 750 PSU, along with the latest Seagate Firecuda 530, two terabyte NVMe drive to alleviate any bottleneck. For our other test benches, the boards changed to the Maximus 13 Hero for 11th gen and the Crosshair 8 Dark Hero for Ryzen 5000 series testing. For both DDR4 setups, we used a Corsair Dominator RGB DDR4 3600MHz kit. All other parts stayed exactly the same. So with all of that out of the way, let's break this down into kind of different sections because there is a lot to go through, especially with this kind of newish hybrid architecture and the addition of other variables when looking at Intel 12th gen because performance aside, we now also get new technology and new functionality. Remember, for anyone who doesn't know, and if you want to find out more, definitely go and check out the preview content we did in this prior to you know this launch. We now not only have new processors, but with this kind of you know big little architecture, we also have other things like Z690 as a chipset, DDR5, PCI Express 5, and a whole host of new things that come with that. And again, like I say, if you want to find out more on that, we do have a video roundup on all the boards we have, which I think it's like nine or 10 from a Zeus Gigabyte and MSI. So definitely be sure to check that out. So all of that to one side, Intel set out to do a couple of things, very much like AMD did when they came out of Ryzen 5000 series. The first was to bring the fight to AMD in a variety of ways, which from the benchmarks, we can safely say they did exactly that. There were only really a few tests that saw AMD dominate, which were more, let's say, core focused, where having a higher core and thread count actually does make a difference. And then you have to ask the question about whether that's worth it for you based on, say, price comparisons. So remember, the 5900X currently comes in at £480 in the UK or $524. The 5950X comes in at £640 or $720, while the 12900K comes in at £580 or $650. And I'm sure if we looked into it, a similar story would play out with the lower end parts too. Now, the other area that Intel were keen to shout home about was gaming. They were always the leaders in gaming performance right up until Ryzen 5000 series launched and had a simple message of improving IPC and beating Intel at gaming. And that's the title that Intel wanted back. And based on the few game tests that we ran, I think we can safely say they did that. It's funny because before all of this, we went to an Intel event in London and saw the same benchmark charts that you guys have seen kind of plastered about here, there and everywhere, comparing the 5950X but we all know that the 5900X was the better chip for gaming and Intel still beat that in our tests. Maybe they wanted to keep that as a bit of a secret for us reviewers and tech media to really kind of give us that element of surprise. If that was the case, good job Intel, you got us. And I can now really kind of tell why Pat Gelsinger was so brash with his tweets and statements. He had a way of backing it up, really that simple. So touching on gaming, because of the way that we actually do test and how we do things, we try to give our CPU benchmarks as much variety as possible and included four game benchmarks and superposition. And we saw that Intel have taken that crown back. But me being me, I'm not completely content on that. And I wanna run a lot more games at varying resolutions between Intel and AMD with potentially just the 12900K versus the 5900X in a kind of showdown of sorts across multiple titles. So let me know in the comments section below, is that something that you actually wanna see? If it is, we'll make it happen. Now, when it came to synthetics like 3D Mark and PC Mark, we did see a close battle with AMD beating Intel in PC Mark, albeit by a small margin, and a slightly bigger margin in favor of Intel in Firestrike. Though the physics score clearly helped boost that overall score for the 12900K. Timespire, we saw the gap even larger in favor of Team Blue, and the same was seen in other benchmarks like Geekbench, showing that it's kind of, a bit different now. It's not just all about cores and threads and trying to make them as fast as possible. There's a lot more at play. Now, when it came to render workloads, this was very interesting as it goes to show that different software and different workloads favored different products with kind of a split really. Corona, for instance, clearly favoring the Beastly 5950X, while the likes of Blender saw better performance from the 12900K. Again, looking at V-Ray and Handbrake 4K conversion, AMD did hold the crown on this due to the larger amount of equal size cores and threads, but this could always get better at a later date as well. 
Cinebench saw some interesting results with, well, what we can safely say a clear bug on Cinebench R15, which was also confirmed by Intel. But in the newer versions, such as Cinebench R20 and R23, we saw huge gains from not only the 12900K, but also the lesser 12700K and even the 12600K when comparing to the likes of the 5600X. Now, when we look at other areas of kind of what these chips actually bring, the addition of DDR5. I mean, with this, we really saw a large increase in overall memory throughput, around 40% in most cases over DDR4, though AMD still having the upper hand when it comes to latency. I mean, what this translates to in the real world at the moment, at least is kind of still to be determined. And with DDR5 being a new technology, I feel it's only kind of really gonna improve over time much like we saw when DDR4 launched and it was compared to DDR3, if we can all remember that far back. Now, one thing that you may have noticed that we completely missed out, overclocking. I mean, I'm a firm believer and have been over the last couple of years that with the introduction of Turbo Boost technology from Intel, PBO from AMD, Thermal Velocity Boost and the like, that overclocking, at least on the manual side of things, unless you're chasing world records, is a bit dead in the water. The juice just isn't worth the squeeze. Now, what I mean by that is that the benefits, they really don't outweigh the drawbacks of power draw and temperatures. And that's one area where things were interesting. When it came to temperatures, the lower end chips, like the 12600K, actually fared pretty well. And even the 12900K did well in our gaming test. But as soon as we put a serious workload task in front of it, well, we saw temperatures creep above 100 degrees Celsius, even under our Notua D15S. So if we're gonna be potentially looking at overclocking in a future video, for me, it would have to be under some form of custom loop. Otherwise, I kind of feel that you may just be too limited by temperatures and temperatures alone. That aside, I do feel that this is potentially only really the start for Intel and that they do actually have more up their sleeve, especially considering when we went to our event in London and every single time we've spoken to Intel, they wanted us to test things on the newly released Windows 11 operating system. But for the sake of adoption rate and what the majority of users are using right now, Windows 10 kind of seem to be the better call. We will actually be working on a direct comparison of Windows 10 versus 11 soon on both Intel 12th gen and the high-end processors from AMD, especially now that AMD looks to be fixed on Windows 11 after their temporary L3 cache situation where performance was nerfed. What we do know is that Intel have historically worked closely with Microsoft, so we can safely bet that Intel will have the upper hand here especially with the way that the operating system will assign tasks to the various cores, big core, little core. But we will know kind of more when we come to actually release that video in the next couple of days. So make sure you're subscribed for that one. Now, there is one thing that I do want to touch on. It's not just about the chips. It's about kind of what else comes with it. DDR5, PCI Express Gen 5, and the other functionality that really comes down to the processors and the Z690 chipset. Now, we do go into more detail in our motherboard focus video, but it's worth putting a note on this one, as the comparisons we did obviously have a bearing, as AMD uses DDR4, while Alder Lake uses DDR5. But for our own test, DDR4 is mature, with faster speeds than ever and tighter timings, whereas DDR5 is kind of still in its infancy, and will, very much like DDR4 did, mature over time. And more importantly, and you'll probably see this today if you've had a little look around on retailers, will come down in price. Now, when it comes to PCI Express 5, I'm like the rest of you, fully aware there's nothing on either the GPU front or the NVMe storage side of things, yet. But with any new technology, it's the chicken and the egg situation. And we talk of both the RTX 3090 Ti coming in January, as well as Intel's first attempt at a consumer GPU around the same kind of time, both sport in PCI Express 5.0. This just kind of puts another tick in Intel's favor for when choosing the very best DIY enthusiast parts. And I, for one, am pretty excited about what's to come in the future as things mature. Windows 11 is more widely adopted and AMD come back with their answer to what's actually happened here today. For now though, let me leave you with one thought. As I can see social media now, very much like we saw when Ryzen 5000 entered, of kind of fanboys on you know either side of the market. I mean, no matter what side of the fence you are on, whether you're Intel till you die or Ryzen forever, throughout all of this, there is only one winner when you finally have competition back in the market. And that's you guys, the consumer, as you finally have a choice worth making again. And on that note, hopefully you enjoyed this video. If you did, you know exactly what to do, and I will see you in the next one. See you later, guys. Bye-bye.